All right, we will call this meeting to order since we're recording it. That seems like the thing to do. Um, welcome to the regular school board meeting on Monday, August 17th, 2020. Uh, this is a virtual meeting and folks are tuning in via live stream um, at the link that is available on our school website and uh, through some recent social media posts as well. Uh, would I, I would entertain a motion to consider and adopt the agenda. I so move Logan's card. Okay, we have a motion uh, and a second. Uh, all those in favor, we'll do a roll call. Uh, Vicki? Aye. Dixon? Dixon, aye. Tim? Logan's card, aye. John? John Carlson, aye. Tracy? Stewie, aye. Bill? Aye. Leonard, aye. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, we would consider a uh, request to speak uh, on the agenda as we are uh, doing this via live stream. If uh, there are any emails to our COVID email or Sarah, if you have uh, heard any responses um, prior to the meeting, um, we could we could try and address those. Uh, or as always, uh, Superintendent Granseth is is super fast to get back uh, to those emails uh, evening of a lot of times. So um, we will uh, move forward and uh, approve the consent agenda. Uh, it is part of the packet that everyone's seen. Um, if we have a motion um, or any discussion. What if I just have a question? This is Tracy. Yeah. Um, so Mrs. Engeldinger, the two kids that had the diploma that we're awarding this month, were those, I mean, how does that work? Were they just two kids that were doing summer school and just kind of made that up or how, you know, or don't tell me we, we didn't forget them the first time around, I don't think so. Nope. Um, and, and I apologize uh but i'm i'm thinking since their names are on the agenda that i probably shouldn't okay speak to that okay well congrats i know it's exciting <clears throat> so ben should i take this I, opportunity um i think yeah let's let's go ahead and call that out of the consent agenda specifically yeah, sure. I'm, I am excited uh, to announce the graduation, uh, the receiving of a St. Peter High School diploma for Elliot Cox and Thomas Wilson. Uh, they have met all the state requirements of the state of Minnesota, as well as the um, school board of St. Peter schools. Congratulations to those two boys. Absolutely. Congratulations. I move to approve the consent agenda. <coughs> John Carlson. Logan's card second. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is uh, uh, Board Treasurer Carlson. I know you can see me, but uh, all the books are in order so for the month. Excellent. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? Yeah, I'd like to uh, ask that we get an update on providing daycare assistance for the school workers, teachers and paraprofessionals, cafeteria workers. I just would like an update on what we're doing with that. I think we can do that later, yep, later in the agenda. Hearing no uh, further discussion on the consent agenda, we'll uh, take a roll call vote. Uh, Vicki? Baker, aye. Drew? Dixon, aye. Tim? Logan's card, aye. John? John Carlton, aye. Tracy? Stewie, aye. Bill? Aye. And uh, I vote aye as well. Uh, Leonard, aye. So uh, that is unanimous. We have two action items tonight. Um, the first uh, has gone to both the calendar committee and the return to school uh, committee this week. And 
both committees recommended that it come before the full board, uh, which is a consideration uh, to approve a revision to the 2020-21 school calendar, uh, which the school board always reserves the right to do. And because of, of COVID and the governor's recommendations and planning, uh, we are bringing this to you now. Yeah, thank you. You really spoke right to it. Um, you know, there are so many things that need to be planned for, and we want to make sure that staff has the training that they need to really be successful with this year and have some time to plan ahead and get the training that they need and have opportunities to work with their colleagues on developing both in-person lessons and online lessons and those for distance learning. And um, as, as this time is quickly approaching, we realize that we, we just need a little bit more time with staff and allow them the time that they really need to be ready on, on the first day of school. And so this calendar does postpone the start of school uh, conferences would be held on September 4th and Tuesday, September 8th, with the first day of school being Wednesday, September 9th. Um, we have had several conversations uh, with, with our staff, with the administration, um, and with our, our union leaders uh, before we brought this to you, and we know that they are appreciative of the the additional time to really make sure that we can do this well. With this, we also adjusted uh, a few of the end of quarter days and uh, the teacher work days to align with our uh, blue and white team days and the distance learning days. And so those changes are also uh, reflected on this calendar. Uh, Great. Any initial discussion? This is Tracy Stewie. I just think um, for people maybe that are watching that haven't sat in on the committee meetings where we really kind of beat this to death almost and talking about it. But I think explaining, um, you know, that there's a minimum number of hours that we're required to have for school. And even though we took, you know, these four days off or whatever, you know, that we are still within that requirement. And I don't know, some people might not realize that. Yes, that, that was one of the things that we took time to go through uh, and look at the daily schedule and the number of days that we have. And all of all levels are within their their limits um, for our 7th through 12th graders. That's uh, 1,020 hours. And we are above that level um, even with this change. Uh, this is John Carlson. Are the semesters pretty balanced or quarters pretty balanced or how far? What a, I couldn't see the number on the, my calendar. I don't have my glasses. <laughs> they are. And I'm not able to look at the calendar right now because I just got locked out again. Um, Principal Engeldinger, could you speak to that? Yeah, I, 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 I can't yeah, access that I, calendar I, either I, right now. Oh. <laughs> what was that, Darren? I said I can actually do it. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I went through and uh, based on, um, you know, the AD schedule and balance those out, work all those numbers, all the uh, quarters, hypothetically speaking, if we stayed in hybrid all year long are, are very balanced, both A and B day. The first quarter of the year, which um, um, I believe you're asking about, is um, potentially a little bit, or I think it's two days shorter just because of, a K-12 approach to back to school conferences. Um, that would be just a little bit shorter because of that. Should I attempt to share the screen with the calendar on it or just skip that? Yeah. All right. Can everybody see that? calendar for the record yes yes and just as an aside i 
um, have a work colleague whose wife is in a metro district and the first day that their high school students will be in person is September 28th. So um, I, districts are doing a lot of different things. Yeah, I did, I did mean to mention that uh, we're seeing school districts all across the state and all across the nation really putting off this beginning of school because we recognize that our, our staff really need some more time together to be able to to start. People may not realize that most of the time teachers come in just three days before the start of the school year. And this year being so different, we really wanted to allow them some more time to, to dig in and plan well. And I, this is Hager. I'd also like to state that I've had a lot of questions from parents about will this extend our end of the year days no, it will not because we meet all those hours that we need to um, for the state. Um, it will not extend out, right? Correct. Okay. I have high hopes that next summer is going to be the most amazing summer ever. <laughs> <laughs> Just 75 degrees, sunny days and hugs <laughs> for three months. <laughs> uh, Chairman Leonard, uh, we, uh, could, yeah. I did kind of, I was able to pull it up on my thing and normally we list how many days are in a quarter next to like the end of the quarter or whatever. My copy that I have does not have that on there. Could we add that? I'm seeing it, um, on the calendar PDF that's hosted on the stpierschools.org site. Okay, I got to go to that site then. So, Drew, is that on the school website then, not on our board? Correct. Oh. I mean, that's what, the, oh, that's what I'm looking at right now. Okay. Uh, let me see if it reflects all the changes. Uh, no, sorry, this is old. Yeah. Sorry, never mind. We, we can update it with those numbers, though. Yeah, that'd be great. Is there anybody that was going to speak to this agenda item? Is somebody monitoring that email or before we make a motion? Well, we we can make a motion and then have and oh, have a yeah. second and then have discussion, correct? Yes. So I will make a motion that we approve the calendar. Tracy Stewie will second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? There were no emails. Okay. Excellent. I, you know, I do, I do think that this is something that I'm sure the public has questions about and, you know, we'll, we'll need this information to adapt their own schedules and, and maybe has preferences Again, I just want to point to all the work that's gone into this with the administrative team and teachers and staff being flexible and being willing to change uh, how they, uh, some of them have done things for 25 years. And so uh, it, this isn't anyone's ideal. Uh, this is the best version of what we're able to do right now, given incredible circumstances. And I just, I appreciate staff and uh, the administrative team and our superintendent and all the work that went into this, as well as parents just being flexible. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to have a great year. It's going to be a lot different than we all expected. It's still going to be a rigorous and meaningful year for our kids. So, um, Tracy Stewie again. So once we approve this, when will we be message or, you know, getting a message out to our families? Uh, we'll start right away. Okay. Excellent. We have a motion in a second. Um, hearing no further discussion, we'll do a roll call vote. Vicki? Hager, aye. Drew? Dixon, aye. Tim? Logan's card, aye. John? John Carlson, aye. Tracy? Stewie, aye. 
Bill? Aye. Leonard, aye. Uh, motion uh, to adopt the the revised calendar uh, for 2020-2021 passes unanimously. Uh, our second agenda item uh, tonight, uh, consider approval of a temporary change to school start and end times. This was also discussed in committees this week, and I will turn it over to Superintendent Granseth to um, brief the whole board. Thank you, Chair Leonard. Um, as we've mentioned many times, there have been so many details for us to work through. Um, one of the biggest challenges for us in a hybrid model is the social distancing of six feet um, and their limiting of transportation to 50% capacity. And so when we look at how do we bring kids to school and do that uh, within, within the guidelines of the state, um, we realized that we really needed two tiers of transportation to be able to bring kids in and, and bring them back home. And there had been some conversation prior, prior to COVID about having a later start for our secondary students. And so sometimes within challenging situations lies opportunity. And so we are proposing a tiered approach to transportation. And with that comes some changes in the start and end times of the school day. Both of these um, changes would be temporary uh, for now, for this year. And uh, the elementary times, the start time is about the same, eight o'clock and ends at 2.30. And then the middle school and the high school actually start at 8.30. And then they would end their days. Uh, the high school would be ending at 3.10 and the middle school at 3.20. The, the time difference there is to allow our buses time to get loaded up at the high school and then go to the middle school and pick, pick up those kids. So our elementary students and our secondary students would be riding at separate times. So we also have um, a reduced exposure between our elementary students and our high school students just with, the, with COVID in mind as well, trying to keep those sites a little bit separated. So uh, with this uh, comes a change in our minutes per, the, per day, getting back to member Stewie's comments earlier about that, that uh, 1,020 hours that is required. We also looked into this uh, as part of all of that work and would still be within, within the limits uh, of the guidelines of the state. And so, we have been working again with our union leadership uh, to make sure that we could do this. We are in the process of working on a memorandum of understanding under because at the elementary level, there are some changes to specialist time within this schedule. And so uh, teachers preparation time, uh, which by contract is 50 minutes would be 40 minutes, but we are providing that extra time at the end of the day. So within a school day, they, they have more preparation time than that is called for by the contract, but um, it's just at a, at a different time. And then we're also providing some added preparation time for part of Friday as well. So we'll continue to work with that. Bringing it to you for consideration was the next step. And I fully expect that those conversations will continue to go well and that we would have a memor memorandum of understanding that we would be bringing to you next time you're together um, regarding that. Great, any questions? Discussion? Hearing none, we can uh, take a motion. Uh, Tracy Stu will make a motion to approve the time changes as proposed. Thank you, Tracy. Vicki, did I hear you second that or not? 
Yes, Vicki Hager, I'll second. Excellent. Um, any further discussion, questions? I just think that we should read out the times and the changes that have, you know, the schedule that we're moving to just to have it out there as part of the record. So just real quick. Yeah, could each principal maybe talk about their building and, and start and end times and we'll go from there? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I'll start with the high school. Um, our start time is 8.30 and like Superintendent Gronseth said, you know, maybe one silver lining is actually getting to, to try a slightly later start time for secondary students. Uh, and it also takes into the schedule also reflect um, no Saints time. We're going full block this year. I think I talked about that maybe at, at our last board meeting, but um, we're going full block to avoid more transitions. Um, the elimination of Saints time also helps to avoid another transition. Uh, so that 310 ending at the high school um, still puts us within the within the appropriate number of um, instructional minutes. At the middle school, the start time is proposed to be 830 and the ending time or the dismissal time is 320. And that 320 dismissal time accounts for the bus transfer um, the bus company will pick up kids at the high school first and then make their way out to the middle school uh, on Lincoln Drive. And uh, North, I'll, I'll speak for North and South since we're on the same start and end of the day schedule. The start of the day um, is at the same time. So it's an eight o'clock instructional start and that's where it's been for a number of years. I think the big shift in the morning that we want all of our parents and students to be aware of is because of state guidelines we can't offer like a morning playground, um, like morning recess starting at 7.30. Um, and so 7.45 basically is when we start the transition into the building. The so buses are gonna start dropping off at 7.45 at North and South. They'll be done at 7.55. Um, students will come right in the building as soon as they get here off the buses and then parents will be dropping off. Our kids will be arriving at 7.45 as well and then we'll start our day at eight. That's the same setup for South. So that'll probably be the bigger shift, a shortened and, you know, recess or kind of just morning routine. Um, and then at the end of the day, we're actually dismissing 20 minutes earlier here at North at 2.30. Um, south will be at 2.30 as well. So that's just a little bit shift at the end of the day. Otherwise, the end of the day routine will uh, be pretty similar. I'm guessing <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking I was waiting for you, Doreen. So in early childhood, um, because our, our days are two and a half hour blocks, we'll continue with that. So our times will not be changing. We'll continue with an 815 to 1045 block and then an 1145 to 215. So there will not be any time changes for preschool, but we will have some um, adjustments with drop off and pick up as far as our protocol. And South? I, um, same. same. Yeah, Ben, I, I, I can't hear South because we're on the, very, the exact same schedule. Excellent. I'm sorry I missed that. All right. We have uh, a motion and a second. Further discussion? All right, well, let's do a roll call vote. Uh, Vicki? Hager, aye. Drew? Dixon, aye. Tim? Lokenskart, aye. John? John Carlton, aye. Tracy? Stewie, aye. Bill? Aye. Leonard, aye. Uh, motion to approve the temporary change to school and start and end times for the coming school year is approved unanimously. We are in uh, informational items now. So moving to uh, the school year co-curricular schedule. Um, we'll turn that over to our activities director, I assume. Right, Jordan? That's correct. So again, feel free to ask any questions that may come up, but uh, just to provide a brief overview of all the changes that have happened. Um, some of the more dramatic changes in terms of the high school league, we're moving 
football and varsity football and varsity volleyball to what they're considering now a third season that will run from March 15th approximately until May 15th. And then the traditional uh, spring sports will get moved from approximately May 15 until early July. Um, knowing full well the implications of that, um, the unknowns of uh, what that will mean for student participation, uh, we'll deal with that uh, as we get to it. Um, we're looking to keep our middle school activities in the same, essentially the same time frame uh, within that spring. But uh, getting back to the fall, some changes that they made. So football, for example, and volleyball will be able to practice in a condensed window. Um, and we have parameters on what that can look like. Um, we're still running a middle school football and middle school volleyball schedule in terms of practices, but uh, they will not travel. Uh, it's strictly intramural. And uh, they will practice on days that they are in school. For example, if Johnny goes to school on Monday and Wednesday, he will mm -hmm. practice football on Monday and Wednesday. Uh, so that is applicable to middle school volleyball, middle mm -hmm. school football. Uh, our traditional 7-12 programs, such mm -hmm. as girls tennis, girls swimming and diving, cross country, and soccer, uh, those have seen a reduction in the number of games and competitive weeks. Um, so we're, we're playing a strictly in-conference schedule for those. Um, we're not sure about what state tournament play could look like, if anything. Uh, we're just thankful that we have an opportunity. Uh, to do that. Uh, today was the first day of practices um, and certainly some growing pains and some changes and getting a whole boatload of kids uh, in a condensed space in a small amount of time. Uh, there's some things that we'll work through, but uh, our coaches are bought into what we need to do. Um, very thankfully, and uh, it speaks volumes to our, our coaches over the summer as well, uh, with our strength program and those that were involved in anything in the school, we didn't have any um, cases revolving around that. So that's a testament. A lot of other schools had to shut down. Um, so again, we, we can take those practices and apply them to the fall. Um, so those are just some updates on the varsity levels. Um, in terms of co-curriculars, we're still working through logistics on how we can best offer things like um, one act play. And obviously that's not until the winter, but uh, things like speech, mock style, all of those really important activities, um, just in terms of what does that look like for kids that aren't in school that day. Uh, we're looking at an additional kind of activity bus, so to speak, to get kids to the middle school and high school for those events on days that they do not have school. Um, another big consideration, we are moving what was the spring play um, is now going to move to the fall. So we're working through things like licensing where we would be able to broadcast those plays. But again, uh, it can be a relatively expensive endeavor to purchase uh, uh, viewing rights to those types of things. But those are considerations, again, opportunities for kids to get involved uh, and even when they're not in school on those days, they still have an opportunity to come in. And if that's the carrot that keeps them going, I think it's incredibly important. And that's why it was so important to keep those middle school activities going in the fall, uh, just to provide that carrot um, when they're, it, it's harder to maybe stay motivated when you're not there around your teachers every day. Uh, so again, uh, schedules completely changed. So it's been a process. We're still working to get information out to families. Um, some logistical cha challenges that we're working through um, not allowing families into the middle school pool for uh, as spectators. Um, that's a dr dramatic change, uh, and it's been met with uh, resistance, certainly, and that's uh, totally expected and understandable. Um, also, uh, limiting the capacity for the middle school fields to 250 people. Uh, the conference has made a decision to allow uh, allocate two passes for each individual on the junior varsity and varsity teams, so we can best limit that and uh, traveling teams are provided an opportunity to see those games as well. Again, it's a challenge. It's different. It's not ideal. Uh, fortunately, we have the systems in place to live stream those events at the middle school field um, with the new six slot cameras that will be installed by them. But uh, again, we're working through those challenges. It's, again, it's not ideal. Uh, we're fortunate that they're able to compete. Um, it was great seeing kids out there today. Um, but again, it's, it's going to be a work in progress and uh, tremendous respect to uh, Mr. Bachman and um, our coaches and um, Barb Regner for getting the ball rolling on some of those things. So, um, so yeah, it's exciting, but uh, certainly a lot of changes and a lot of changes to come. I, I can't speak to any winter changes as well. Um, they have not made decisions on that. I would expect some sort of a condensed season, but we have had no, um, no information from the high school league in that regard. So happy to field any questions if you have any, but uh, yeah, we're thankful we can still compete. Any questions? Yeah. Hey, uh, Jordan, this is John Carlson. Um, 
where are we at with live streaming for the swim meets? Is that, are we still working on that? Still working on that. Um, again, a, a lot of it's technology based. Uh, we have the systems to run our own cameras, but again, just the logistics of having someone there and plugging in the PA, as you alluded to in our co-curricular meeting. Again, we just haven't finalized those things, but that's something we're working towards and we'd like to have in place. Again, it's just a process, um, how, to, how to best do that and manage those things. And then is there any talk about if there is going to be a postseason this fall or is it just regular season? We haven't gotten any word from the high school league uh, in regards to our, uh, our region meetings. They've alluded to the fact of potential section play, but we have not seen nothing from the high school league to suggest either. Um, so we're, we're kind of just taking it as conference only right now and anything beyond that um, uh, will be great. But I, I just don't, I, I, can't, I can't speak to any state tournament or section play beyond that, just because we don't know. Thank you. I just have a comment. I just appreciate all the work you have done for this. I mean, it must be just mind boggling. So I appreciate, and I'm sure everybody does, the work you guys have put into this. Thank you. Team effort. <laughs> yeah. This is Tracy Stewie, um, echoing again what Vicki said. You do a great job communicating with your coaches and you just never can hear that enough, so that's good. Um, a question I kind of had was, and I don't think it was in there last year when I was registering um, my kiddo, they had some of those like mental health screening questions in there about, you know, have you um, been down, depressed or hopeless? You know, all those kind of questions. So my question is, is, is that just enough, they were just getting put in there or is any of that like a flag for you that you would then refer on to somebody? Or are they just collecting data or why are we asking that? It's a great question. It's part of the Minnesota State High School League uh, health questionnaire. So again, that's something that's dictated by the state. And again, it's, it provides a, a, what maybe wouldn't be a flag otherwise that we wouldn't have received before. And for a lot of those situations and not like mental health in particular, a lot of it, you know, you're not necessarily gonna refer a student on to a medical professional. However, it allows for that door to be open between that student athlete and their coach. Uh, if, if it's, you know, in starting that dialogue on what, how they can best meet those needs. Again, mental health is gonna be a huge component of activities this year, um, far beyond just athletics, but anything that can get a kid involved, they need that connection with the director or an advisor uh, in addition to their teachers. Um, so again, to, the, to that point, it is a high school league directive that is included in that registration process. However, we can use that um, as, as a data point and start to facilitate those conversations. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, one other question? Yeah, yeah. just one, one more thing uh, regarding culminating events. I, I forgot to mention this. As a conference, we're doing the best we can to provide a culminating event. Uh, in terms of uh, an East Division versus West Division champion. So we do have some semblance of a championship that we're trying to provide something to work towards, um, but it doesn't work for everything, but we are trying to provide that. So if section play does not come into fruition, we still have that. And I go, I just, winning trophies is not the end all be all. Um, however, it is nice to have that recognition of success beyond just regular season games. So that is just an additional fact with a Feel free to ask any questions or uh, comments as you see it. If you see our kids not doing the correct things out on their fields, certainly let me know. Um, but again, we're doing the best we can with what we have, and it's just going to take a little time. And I think provide a good barometer of what it's going to be like when we have kids back into our buildings. And these kids now can be leaders, um, theoretically, uh, with their peers uh, when they come back into the schools. Uh, Jordan, how many, how many days, it, if I'm doing uh, – junior high or middle school football, how many days of football do I actually get? Great question. So again, initially, uh, the, the plan was that we were going to start those sports approximately the 2nd of September. We still may do that, even though school hasn't officially started, just to provide that opportunity. But we were looking at about approximately 12 practices per kid. Uh, by the time you practice every day, um, and they would end essentially around MEA. Most of our fall sports, even the varsity ones, will end around or before MEA, and this would kind of fit in line with that. Um, but to that point, and I forgot to mention, we did reduce our activity fees for each um, because we had a 30% reduction in the number of seasons. Uh, I, it was basically a 30% reduction in the fee for that uh, for those activities. So, for example, if a fee of $105 went down to 75, 
and our typical fee of $45 for seventh through ninth grade went down to 30. And to your point about those intramural activities, middle school volleyball and middle school football, uh, that's been reduced to $20. Uh, it provides a, um, something coming back because it again, it's a, it's a very large cost to run those programs, even on a smaller scale without travel. But uh, again, we did reduce those fees, uh, not only to uh, meet the needs of the family, certainly, but then also to, uh, we have an adjustment and it, uh, we felt that that was the best way to accommodate that for families. Um, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm certain we'll see uh, an increase in scholarship requests at some point, but uh, we just haven't seen that spike. Um, and because now we're, we're essentially missing out about 150 registrants between football and volleyball. Um, so our fall numbers are gonna be significantly lower. Um, so it will be very interesting to see over the course of the year what the, our MDE report in terms of uh, Title IX reporting uh, will look like, just based on that we things got shifted around and what that does for our spring, spring sports that are now running into the summer. Um, I think it, um, it puts kids in a, and families in a challenging spot. Hopefully they choose uh, school athletics uh, and school opportunities because we are an extension of the classroom, but um, other opportunities are going to be available. So we'll offer what we can and where we can and make the most of it. And uh, we'll go from there. So. Thank, thank you so much. Excellent. Well, we really appreciate all the all the work and, um, you know, it's great to be able to have a season with everything that's going on. So into reports, building principles. All right. Just to be clear, I am uh, representing all the building principles this evening. I repeat, Mrs. Elke, all the building principles. Um, <laughs> the only reason for that is um, we're all, you know, we've been talking with so many teachers here recently. There's there's getting to be a lot of um, evidence of teachers slowly returning to buildings over the last couple of weeks. We can see it in just decorations in the hallway or texts and questions about scheduling, um, you know, and just just the emails. And but then but then also <laughs> the conversations we've been having is something like it's almost like everybody's like a first year teacher or a first year principal because we're kind of going through the same things um as none of us have been through pandemics for the start of the school year before so i'm just going to do um just recap a little bit um what's been going on in the buildings um summer school and sac finished up uh just last week so i believe we had k-12 12 about 100 60 students, I think, all the way through all our summer school programs. So there was an extended learning um, year or it was targeted services. So um, that went well. And just a reminder, that was a hybrid approach to learning. So we, we had students on and off, um, kind of an A, B day approach so that we could be um, kind of get some formative information on how a setup like that may work. And that leads nicely into our workshop training that will have a lot to do with blending learning or hybrid learning, like how do we manage students both learning in person and learning remotely at the same time. So good number of our summer school teachers are also our coaches that will be helping train during workshop week. We have a lot of powerful insight to have from summer school. Like I mentioned, uh, the only thing going on um, at North all summer was, was the SAC program, and that uh, went really well. They had about three or four classrooms that they were using here at North. Um, and so now it's been <laughs> pretty quiet to start out this week with no students in the building, but luckily Jordan's program was able to balance that out a little bit with seeing students out on the uh, practice fields at the high school. So it's always great to see students in the building as it was made for that. Um, <clears throat> we are really quickly finishing up our initial data collection. So as all of you know, we've been sending out information and surveys and Google form links. Um, to get everybody's like intention of like what are, what are their plans for returning to school. The big one is collecting and pinpointing the amount of families who are most planning on distance learning only. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to, are we're balancing our sections and our homerooms based on that information. So we're still trying to provide kind of a balanced approach um, to getting that schedules um, finalized, those homerooms finalized. And we have been taking a lot of calls. I guess I'm just basing that off North information, but I think the other buildings are taking calls from parents too, just kind of wondering about schedules, wondering about kind of that A, B balance. If there's 
any way possible that we can kind of balance it out or make sure um, students have maybe the same days as another student based on families that are working together. And we'll certainly try to um, do the best we can to make the program work for all families, but I know it's been that's certainly going to be a scheduling um, challenge. So um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to keep sending emails or calls. <clears throat> um, we're planning on getting that information out, like I said, as soon as possible, as soon as we get the, the A, B schedule um, figured out in Infinite Campus. And I think that's a good, now is a good chance to kind of put in a plug for families just to update any contact information in Infinite Campus, since we're relying so heavily on our student information system, get communication out in a timely manner. So any updates on phone numbers and email addresses, that would be great. And we do want to give a shout out to our office staff as they did a wonderful job with a follow-up call for any families that didn't figure or send in their information through the Google Forms. So we had those individuals call every family um, that didn't return those surveys so we can move forward with our planning. <clears throat> on, uh, on a more normal or typical um, event, we, had, uh, we have new teachers coming in this week. So we have um, a handful of new teachers that are starting their, their trek in St. Peter's schools or their careers or continuing their careers in St. Peter's schools. So I thank the mentors and Mrs. Elke for organizing that. Certainly, again, isn't a, a typical year is how that's rolling out, but we're trying to keep it as much as possible through um, like the mentoring that we always provide every year. It's just gonna take it a little bit different format with online learning and videos and things like that. And then also we're um, working hard to finalize any handbooks. We have, uh, we usually, this is actually the board meeting that all of our building handbooks get sent to you on, but um, we have, we're gonna have to append all of them with um, protocols and practices based on COVID um, expectations and a safe return to school. Um, so we're working on those and those should be finished up here um, within the next couple of days to share with some of our leadership teams. So in the last item I want to share is just want to thank the custodians. Um, the buildings look really shiny and ready to roll. Um, they, they worked in overtime early in the spring um, and now we're certainly getting to some of those projects that we don't always have time to get to, but the buildings are looking great. Now we just need to get the teachers and get those students back in here to get back and roll. So that's all the updates across the buildings I have. Great. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions about any of that? All right, thank you very much, uh, Darren. Uh, we turn it over to uh, our superintendent of schools for, for Mr. Gronsas' report. Thank you, Chair Leonard. Well, as Darren has said, this has been an extraordinarily busy month <laughs> so far. Uh, after receiving guidance from the state, we've been working through details of our reopening plan. And when we talk about those details, think about every aspect of our typical school experience. All of it had to be reconsidered from what it looks like when a student is getting ready to leave for school in the morning, talking about putting together some screening, COVID screening kits that we'll be sending home with refrigerator magnet of questions to ask before you go to school in the morning um, to how we ride the bus to how we approach school and enter school and walk down the hallway what it looks like in the classroom and getting breakfast and cleaning schedules and cafeteria practices and child care so many details and i really want to thank everyone that has been involved in making these plans. I know that it has been countless hours of work and I so appreciate this team and everything that they've done. Um, I do want to talk about childcare just a bit. I know um, Dr. Soderlund and others have had some questions. And so I just wanted to share a little bit more information about that. It was one of the questions on the survey that we sent out to families asking if if child care for uh, tier one workers was something that they would need. And I do wanna be clear that this is tier, tier one workers as defined by the state. We've expanded that 
uh, a bit to include school district employees because we know that our employees are there for our students and our families. And so we want them to be able to have childcare as well. So Tammy Skinner um, has been working <laughs> nonstop to prepare for providing this tier one workers um, childcare. And it is free during the school day on the days that they aren't in the school. <laughs> so there's the in-person days and then there's distance learning days and the child care is available for tier one families on the distance learning days. Um, that is free of charge during the school day. There will also be before and after child care available for a fee. And Tammy, I know you're in the meeting, so if I start going astray, please jump in and stop me. <laughs> uh, we will be providing this child care in a few different places. The Most of it will be at the community center, but there will also be uh, a few spaces at north and south. So there we have capacity for about 60 students at the community center in several rooms there and then capacity for 20 students at North and 20 students at South. So right now we'd be able to provide for uh, about 100 students a day. I think this is enough capacity to cover the need, but time will tell. Um, Fridays, when everyone is on distance learning, childcare will be at the elementary schools. And then again, the before and after school is available for, for a fee for families. Tammy, do you have anything that you would like to add to that? You did a great job of covering everything. <laughs> Shoo. <laughs> and again, thank you so much for all of the time and effort you're putting into, into doing that. And I believe we're still uh, have some positions that we're uh, looking for people? That is correct. People can apply online through the school district website. Very good. Thank you. So uh, by now, almost every family uh, that attends St. Peter's Schools has either filled out a survey online or has been called by someone at the school district to provide us with their family plans for the fall. We will need more information though. Um, we will need to know the specifics behind those choices that were indicated. There's registration materials for childcare as well. Tammy, do you wanna let people know where they can find that? Yes, um, people can go to the school district website and then click the community and family education tab. And underneath that, you'll see a listing for Saints Overtime, which is our new name for school age care. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And of course, we will be looking for transportation information and food service and all the information that is typically collected at the beginning of the school year. So please be watching for a request for that information. And again, if, if you need tier one child care, uh, we do ask that you provide us with information from your employer to help us to know that you are a, a tier one worker or if you work for the school district, um, we can have HR <laughs> talk to Tammy and uh, let them know that you are an employee. So even with all the details uh, that we still have to work through, we are looking forward to the start of the school year. It will be different. It's not going to be perfect. We're likely going to have to make some adjustments once we get going. Uh, but we are so excited to have our students and staff back in the buildings again and to have our, our buildings humming with activity like they should be. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Superintendent Grantseth. Any uh, questions? Yeah, Ben, this is Tim. I have a question. So I'm just, I'm just curious after our last discussion that we had at the last meeting regarding uh, screening at the door, we 
we're for surely not screening at the door. We are screening at home and just making sure that that was the final decision. Right. Following our conversation, uh, we went back and looked through all of our guidance. We revisited guidance that we received from the CDC, and they are really recommending that that screening happen at home and that it, that it isn't taking place at school or at the door. OK. This is Tracy Stewie. I have a question. We got all those surveys back. What how, what percentage of our students are choosing to do distance learning all the time? Um, the last time I looked at it, which was yesterday afternoon, I believe it was at 13%. OK. By and far, by far the biggest majority of students coming coming into school um, with, I believe it was about 86%. And a little over one percent, uh, we're going to make some other choice, either um, in online school or homeschooling. Okay, thank you. How close are we? What's our? How close to one hundred percent are we in getting the surveys back? I'm sure there's still some people we need to hear from. Is it a big population or? No, we actually had a very good response to our online uh, our initial request for that information and then when we sent out more on social media and sent out a text uh, i believe we were up to about 1900 at that point and i know that they have been uh, calling nonstop since yesterday and i think that we're just about through through the list i know afi and maripsa have also been been calling um, and making sure that all of our families are able to fill out that information. And could you, I, this might be too big of a question, but uh, what is the protocol if a teacher uh, gets COVID or a student gets COVID and contact tracing and how does that all play out? Unfortunately, we've, we've already had some practice. Um, you know, just just like the rest of the community, um, I think just about everybody could uh, think of someone that they know who's been exposed or has tested positive. And really, COVID, COVID is confidential. So we wouldn't be able to say, you know, teacher A and or student B uh, has tested positive. And if you think that you've had close contact, whatever it really goes the other way so mdh and the county work with a person who has been um, tested positive to find out who their close contacts are and then they are contacted so there won't be a report of uh you know principal doherty tested positive um that that really um wouldn't be appropriate for us to share that information about a staff or a student, you may know um, that someone is gone, <laughs> or you may be notified that um, you had been exposed, uh, but you wouldn't necessarily know who, who that was. Um, if someone has had close exposure, we do have protocols in place. That's part of the handbooks that we're creating about how long someone should self-isolate um, or if they have tested positive, how long they need to stay out. And we'll be following all of those guidelines. Um, Rachel Fitch has been key in helping us, as has Barb and Mark, to really communicate what those protocols are. And that's part of the information that we'll share with families too about what they should, what they should do, um, should they be exposed or someone in their family either has symptoms or has tested positive. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Let's let's go around the table. Um, Vicky, we'll start with you. 
Well, I just want to thank everybody for everything they've done through this process. Um, it's great. I don't know how you're doing it, but it's great. Thank you, Drew. The only other that I was thinking about um, was uh, device access, technology access for the students. And I'm guessing we will have an update on that at some point, but I can ask the question, maybe we know. Um, do we have enough coverage currently for devices for each of the students? Because I know that part of that survey was, do you or do you not need a device? And I know a lot of students turned them in you know, at the end of the year last year, and I think there was some confusion about all that. Or, okay, are we going to be sending those back out or how that's going to go? So. And Mr. Overbrook, could I call on you to respond? Oh. <laughs> 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 that, that was uh, really good. Yeah. So I guess now for, for those of you, I don't know if it popped up, but the answer was you cannot. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, from what I understand, we will be getting a device to every family who needs one, and we're also working on providing hotspots for those families to have internet service if they do not have that service, working with uh, both the city and the county to be able to use, um, to work with them to be able to locate some in high populated areas of town where there would likely be a lot of students and perhaps uh, push out our signal a little farther from some public buildings. And so making sure they all have what they, what they need Thank you. Excellent. Tim? I don't have anything, Ben. I think everybody's doing above and beyond. So. Thank you. John? Yes, yeah, since this is the last meeting before you guys start, good luck to everybody. I mean, you guys <laughs> worked hard to put together a plan. And uh, I, I just wish you guys the best of luck and uh, in trying to educate and connect with every kid. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Tracy? Um, kind of the same thing and just, you know, keep up the good work. And I know it's just, it's very overwhelming and talking to people and all the work there is to be done. And, and just to the families, just, you know, to ask questions if you have to. Um, and it's, it's a big deal for everybody to have to go through things so different at the beginning of the year, but must all remain flexible. So, but thanks for everybody's hard work. Thank you, Bill. Thank you everybody for what you're doing. This is uh, mind boggling the complexity of this situation. So thank you to everybody for all your efforts. Thank you, Bill. Just to just to add a few comments, one of the biggest, uh, most important duties of the school board is to manage the finances of the district. And uh, you know, it's 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 always important. But I think when you have a time like this, um, it really underscores uh, the value uh, of having a budget <laughs> uh, reserve and. Uh, being able to draw on that. Um, I think that we are doing the right thing and we're focusing on students and families and learning and getting the school year going. I think in the and as the months uh, continue throughout the school year, we are going to be dealing with the financial impacts of this uh, and they are going to be large. Um, you know, I, I think when we talk about 1% of families or one percent of students um, making other options every family has to do what's right for them um, mm -hmm. but that has financial implications on the district and one percent 
seems like a very reasonable amount to me, but that's still $225,000 a year that if those students don't come to school in St. Peter, we don't have in our budget. Um, so that is a financial cost. Uh, providing daycare to tier one uh, families is required by the state. I think it's the right thing to do, but it's required. Us extending that to school district staff is absolutely the right thing to do. That's going to come at a cost. You know, our consent agenda tonight, we approved some additional hires to um, address cleaning and COVID and all of this. And um, this is something that we absolutely need to do and will do, but we can do in part because of the work that this district and this board has done over the last decade to make sure that we had a budget reserve. And, you know, we, we had talked about potentially coming out for a referendum uh, this fall. I see GFW just passed a, a referendum, a operating referendum. So congratulations to that district. Um, we decided that given uh, the uncertainty uh, with everything that we wanted to take an extra year to be fair to our uh, constituents and our voters uh, so that we could approach this decision um, with all of the information uh, that we needed to make the choice uh, a year from now. Um, but again, you know, all of this stuff is expensive. Running a school district is expensive and dealing with COVID is expensive. And um, it's something that we're going to be talking about at board meetings um, well into the future. So uh, I just wanted to um, get that out there. And I want to remind uh, everyone that we have uh, an upcoming school board meeting, the regular school board meeting, September 21st. Uh, that is a Monday at 6.30 p.m. We are tentative to be in the governor's room at the community center. Um, just like our schools are going back in a hybrid capacity, uh, the board has uh, opted to follow those same guidelines and go back in a hybrid capacity as well. Uh, so the bo board will be in person. We do have limits um, because of social distancing and capacity uh, to that room. So we will be doing um, a, a, a hybrid plan of we'll be in person, but we'll have some administrators who will be uh, virtual. Um, Paula Jr. will be uh, will will be uh, virtual as well, um, and then we'll we'll still have the public be attending uh, the the virtual streams as well. But we will be in person, and I hope as uh, COVID numbers continue uh, that we can go back to a more traditional. Uh, board schedule and eventually uh, school schedule as well. But that will all, all be dependent on um, what is happening with the pandemic. I, I do want to say one other thing that, um, you know, along with the upcoming meeting that I just really appreciate the, the board and, and administration's responsiveness and ability to meet. Uh, we've had a lot more committee meetings uh, in the last few weeks than we typically have as a board. Um, everyone's been available to, to meet. Um, I really appreciate that. I know that um, the administrators have put in a tremendous amount of work and it pales, uh, the, the board uh, contribution pales in comparison to that, but, but it is still a lot of work for the school board too. And I, I appreciate all of you, so. Thanks everybody. Do we, do we want someone else to keep talking or we could also adjourn as well? Dixon, I move to adjourn. Excellent. We have a motion in a second. Uh, we'll do a roll call. Uh, Vicki? Aye. Drew? Dixon, aye. Tim? Logan Skirt, aye. John? John Carlson, aye. Tracy? Stewie, aye. Bill? Aye. Uh, Leonard, I uh, motion to adjourn carries unanimously. Thanks, everybody.